So I put together three more videos on information I feel needs to be more investigated and more available. The first one is on the vice president of Pfizer who was confronted by an ex-employee whistleblower who would like some answers about certain statements made by the director of research and development. The second video is on a Senate hearing about certain people being paid off to lie about the origins of the virus. And the third one is of a clip I showed in the last video I made on the government, the White House, and specifically the president doing what they can to suppress and censor all of this information from coming out. And the same information that if maybe if you still make it today or if you would have made it over the last few years could have you banned, fired, uh, suppressed. And I just feel that now that some of this information is coming out, it needs to be more available. So I put all of these clips together to make it easier to find or to show other people or to share or to do your own research. But without any further talking from me, here you go. You certainly look a lot better than that walking corpse I saw last week. Well, no one's ever going to see that again, I can promise you that. I can't stress how important it is our secret be kept from the public. I could have you arrested for breaking in here. Carter, you've discovered the holy grail of modern medicine. Why the hell would you keep it buried like this? Well, I'll tell you why. Because there's far more money to be made in treating a disease than in curing it. Why cure someone of cancer in a day if we can treat them for a lifetime and bill them every step along the way? What? That's insane! Carter, what you're doing here is criminal, and I'm going to tell the whole world about it. Is that right? Who's going to believe you? The Internet? Williamson County School Board. It has come to my attention that your vice chair is the VP of State and Government Relations at Pfizer. My name is Debbie Bernal, and I am one of the two whistleblowers at Pfizer that helped reveal the link between myocarditis and the mRNA vaccine. I also helped expose Dr. Jordan Tristan Walker, who is on camera saying, I quote, why don't we mutate the virus ourselves, end quote, quote, that is not what we say to the public, end quote. Quote, COVID is a cash cow, end quote. A revolving door for government officials. It's good for the pharmaceutical industry. That's you, Mr. Vice Chair. But bad for America, end quote. Because, quote, the regulators are not going to be as harsh on Pfizer. So my question today for the Vice Chair, and I'm sure all of the parents here of Williamson County would like to know, does Jordan Tristan Walker still work at Pfizer? Thank you. You know how the virus keeps mutating? Yeah. Well, one of the things we're exploring is like, why don't we just mutate it ourselves? Don't tell anyone what's going on. You gotta probably don't tell anyone. Why don't we just mutate it ourselves? That is not what we say to the public. Well, that is not what we say to the public. No. COVID is a cash cow. Either way, it's gonna be a cash cow. COVID is probably a cash cow for us for a while going forward. Okay. I think it's a door for all government officials. It's pretty good for the industry, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's bad for everyone else in America. We're here with the vice president of Pfizer, who's rendered mute when asked a pretty simple question about whether Jordan Walker is working for Pfizer. Josh. Hi, James O'Keefe. Um, is Jordan Walker still working for Pfizer? Hey, Josh. Is Jordan still working at Pfizer? Josh, is Jordan at Pfizer? That's the vice president of Pfizer ignoring my question. Hey, Josh, uh, quote, why don't we mutate the virus? Quote, revolving door for government officials, good for the pharmaceutical industry, that's you, Mr. Vice President of Pfizer, but bad for America because, quote, the regulators are not going to be as harsh on Pfizer. Is this guy still working for Pfizer? We're here with the Vice President of Pfizer, who's rendered mute when asked a pretty simple question about whether Jordan Walker is working for Pfizer. I mean, this video was viewed like 50, 100 million times. Is he still working at Pfizer, yes or no? It looks really bad that you're so quiet right now. It looks horrible. I was locked in an interrogation room. They, they parked. They followed me home. Why did your company tell my tell company? Tell the American people, is Jordan Walker working for Pfizer, yes or no? It's a simple question. You are responsible for the death of millions. Sir. Wow. This is Josh Brown. Rendered mute, his cronies on the school board saying that, quote, they don't care. I don't, I don't care what anyone says. They don't care. They don't like sunlight. They do not like it when people show up and ask questions. You published U.S. intelligence dangerously compromised, warned CIA and FBI whistleblowers. You're not the only one to report this, of course. 
but uh, I was reading your report on it this morning. This is something that you have been warning about for quite some time, and the allegations stem from a whistleblower who has come forward to the House, a whistleblower from the Central Intelligence Agency. I have the letter, the relevant letter here from the House Oversight Committee. The whistleblower alleges that a CIA team was paid to change its assessment of the origins of COVID-19. Do I have that broadly correct? Is that your understanding yes, of, the, of the report? Yeah. Um, this is obviously a, a, a bombshell report, uh, deeply, deeply troubling. I'm glad that uh, the House is going to look into it. We should look into it. What caught my attention is you point out in your article on this that the government has deliberately violated the COVID Origins Act, which this body passed unanimously, which the House passed, the President signed into law, and maybe he wasn't so happy about signing it into law, but he did. It is the law of the land, and which required that all of the government's intelligence on the origins of COVID be made public. Instead, what the administration did was offer up a summary, which they then in turn heavily redacted. And you point out that in addition, the government refused to, the administration refused to report the names of scientists who fell ill at the Wuhan Institution, Institute of Virology in 2019, despite the fact they know the names. The intelligence community knows the names. Now, you're absolutely right to say this is a violation of the COVID Origins Act, and I would know because I wrote it. So I'm not very happy about the fact that this administration continues to flaunt, flout, completely ignore public law passed, again, unanimously by the United States Senate. For what end, I can't tell. I can't figure out why in the world. I, I don't know what partisan gain there is to it. Why in the world they want to lie to the American people. You conclude your article by saying the government has become extremely comfortable with lying to us. Just explain what you mean by that and, and tell us why you think this is so significant. Well, sure. And just on the very specific point, if we were the first to identify the, the three people that uh, contracted the coronavirus in China. They were the people working on gain-of-function research in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. The Wall Street Journal confirmed our reporting two weeks later, and then I, I think it was one week after that or a few days after that, uh, the ODNI report came out and it uh, did not reveal this information. And we had multiple sources, the Wall Street Journal. We have no idea if the Wall Street Journal sources were the same, but uh, I think we're clearly seeing a lot of abuses of power occurring in multiple executive uh, agencies. So we've seen it with the FBI. One of the things that we noted yesterday was that we saw perverse incentives in the FBI to go after so-called domestic violent extremism, pulling an agent off of things like child exploitation, onto really hyping a set of cases that, that particularly appeared to be aimed at spreading disinformation around the idea that there is a significant increase of, ex of domestic extremism when we don't think that the evidence shows that. Uh, and now we see this report uh, that came out that suggests that there's an FBI whistleblower who says that six of the seven analysts had said it was a laboratory origin and that they had reversed their position in some exchange for some sort of a salary bonus or some sort of a financial incentive. So, uh, and we've been, you know, so we keep documenting it. We just keep finding agencies and agencies, DHS involved in trying to create a disinformation uh, governance board. Um, I keep, you know, the censorship industrial complex, we just keep finding new parts of it. So in the research for this testimony, we discovered this deep trust alliance that had, you know, what appears to be ties to the security and intelligence agencies of the United States government, appears to be trying to set itself up, although it's now kind of ghosted after 2021, but it appeared to try to set itself up to decide what is reality and what are fakes for people, and I think it should have a chilling effect in that we, that's not how we do free speech in America. We don't have government agencies. We don't have uh, cutouts or front groups that appear to have support from those agencies telling the American people what's true, what's false, or telling social media companies behind the scenes what they should be censoring. And just to that last point, we now know, thanks to the case Missouri versus Biden, that that's exactly what this administration from the White House, to the FBI, to the State Department, to the CDC, to CISA, have all been meeting with the social media companies for years now, giving them direct commands about what to censor and take down, naming specific accounts and specific speech they want suppressed, threatening the social media platforms if they don't do it, and remarkably, 
and I'm quoting the court here, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and there's a huge evidentiary record. Everybody can go, don't take my word for it. Go read the record. It's all on the record. Senator Holy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to the witnesses for being here. Um, I think it's safe to say that, that all of you are here today because you are opposed to government censorship. Is that, is that right? Have I got that broadly correct? Okay, we can agree on that much. Um, book banning is a form of government censorship. Is that broadly speaking correct? Professor Knox, let me, you're an expert in this. Let me just ask you. Um, book banning is a problem under the First Amendment because it's the government telling private individuals, authors, what have you, what they can and cannot write, telling the public what they can and cannot read. Is that broadly speaking correct? Yes, that's correct. So now what if, what if the books were digital only? Could the government ban them then? So no, no hard copies, no, no physical copies, it's just digital books. Could the government engage in book banning then under the First Amendment? No problem. No, that's about f a format of the particular book, and that really doesn't matter when it comes to whether or not government is banning a book. Okay, what, what, if, what if the government made a list of authors whose books it wanted banned and also went to all of the publishing houses in America, the government did, and said, do not publish the books by any of these authors or we will punish you. Is that a problem in the First Amendment? My hope is that the government would not be involved in the decisions of a private company. Good, I would hope so too, but apparently that is not the case in the United States of America today under this administration because the hypotheticals I've just given you aren't hypotheticals at all. They've happened and we know that they are happening the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals just ruled in a case, Missouri versus Biden. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. It's going to go down, I think, as a landmark case in the worst possible way in First Amendment law, because what the Court of Appeals found is that the White House, not just the federal government, but the White House actively coerced every major social media platform in America. Let me say that again. Every major social media platform in America to ban speech that the White House did not like. What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about speech on the COVID-19 pandemic, speech on the 2022 congressional elections, speech related to mask mandates, speech related to vaccines. What did the White House do? Well, over a period of years, they met with on a regular basis the leaders of social media companies and demanded that the speech they did not like be taken down. They further demanded that these same social media companies amplify the White House's speech. Amazing. So take down all of this speech that we don't like, amplify our own speech. Unbelievable. What kind of speech are we talking about? Well, for example, not just public officials, but Parents, here's an example from my state, the state of Missouri. This is, I'm reading you from the opinion here. One parent who posted on nextdoor.com, which is a site operated by Facebook, posted an online petition to encourage his school to remain mask optional, found that his posts were removed without notifying him, and his friends never saw them. Another parent in the same school district who objected to mask mandates for school children responded to Dr. Fauci on Twitter and promptly received a warning from Twitter that his account would be banned if he did not delete the tweets criticizing Dr. Fauci's approach to mask mandates. These objections, amazingly, these, this censorship was taken at the direct behest of the federal government, the direct behest of the Biden administration. Professor Knox, is this a violation of the First Amendment? Only a judge can make that determination. And a judge has. I'm glad you said that. Multiple judges. The district court, federal district court, said there was a direct First Amendment violation. Court of Appeals, unanimously, three-judge panel, unanimously said direct First Amendment violation. 
I can't think of another time in American history when the President of the United States, and I say that advisedly, because the record reflects that White House officials were sending emails and communications to these companies saying that the President himself wanted the censorship. So you've got the government doing exactly what Professor Knox said is not permitted under the First Amendment, directly coercing the speech of private parties, and not just one or two authors, but parents all across the country, unprecedented in the history of this nation. So I'm glad we're having this hearing today. I hope that we will have more like it to expose the censorship happening at the highest levels of our government. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that this this opinion, this judgment by the Fifth Circuit, Missouri versus Biden, be entered into the record in full. Without objection. I will leave it there. I know there are other Senator Kennedys here who want to ask questions, but I just want to say for the record that this kind of censorship is un-American, it is unconstitutional, and I hope it will go down as a sad chapter in American history that we can close here and now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Senator Kennedy.